This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. While professing admiration for the moral and spiritual teachings of Scripture, many readers report that the book of Genesis disturbs them. A straightforward reading of its early chapters, they point out, makes it appear that God created the earth only a few thousand years ago. And yet, science affirms that the beginning was many millions of years in the past. Taking the Genesis account seriously, then, would have humans living alongside dinosaurs, while we know that the last of them died out some 65 million years ago, long ages before the first humans saw the light. Now, the age of the earth is a subject in itself, and one that this series will deal with elsewhere. But let's look now at just one part of that question. What part did dinosaurs have in history? And did any human ever see one? When the first fossils of dinosaurs were discovered in the early 1800s, they triggered excitement and confusion. What were these bones? Some even questioned whether they were truly the remains of real animals. Perhaps, said some of the faithful, these bones were a trick of Satan, placed in the earth to cause us to doubt God's word. But whatever one's presuppositions, the fossils could not be denied. They were indeed something real. The work of collection and restoration gave us irrefutable evidence. The museums began to display skeletons like this one of Tyrannosaurus rex, some 40 feet long and weighing perhaps six tons. Even more massive was Brachiosaurus at 30 tons, stretching some 85 feet from nose to tail. And children gaped at Pteranodon, picturing it swooping past with its 18-foot wingspan. Many Christians are still troubled as they attempt to fit dinosaurs into the Bible. They have to acknowledge that the term dinosaur doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture, so at best these creatures are an embarrassment. But then, we could hardly expect to see that name in the text. As more and more of these fossils were unearthed, people wondered what they should be called. It was Sir Richard Owen, then, who coined the name. Calling on his knowledge of Greek, he cited Danos, which means awesome or terrifying, and Soros, a lizard. They were dinosaurs, the terrible lizards. That was in 1841. And so it's no surprise that the word is not in the Bible. It hadn't been coined yet. But does this mean that these beasts are not mentioned in Scripture? Perhaps not. They may be there under another name. In the book of Job, in the section where God describes to Job some of the wonders of his creation, we find a description of a land monster. This is Job 40 verses 15 through 18. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar, the sinews of its thighs are close-knit, its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron." End quote. What animal might this be? If you have a study Bible, you may find a footnote on this passage that suggests it refers to the elephant. But God says its tail sways like a cedar tree, and we know what the tail of an elephant looks like. No comparison there. Other study footnotes name the rhinoceros, but if anything, his tail is even smaller and some Bibles propose a hippopotamus, perhaps the least likely of all. 
There doesn't seem to be any animal in our zoos that fits this description. But how about a sauropod dinosaur, like Apatosaurus? Of course, that would mean that the author of the book of Job had actually seen such a beast, wouldn't it? Suppose we just hold that thought for now. If we look at the next chapter of Job, chapter 41, there's a monster of the sea on display. Quote, Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook? Or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. End quote. Now, what could that be? A whale? No, this creature is covered with scales. A giant squid, perhaps. Same problem. Leviathan has scales like a fish. But among the fossils, we do find some candidates. Here's Chronosaurus, some 40 feet in length. And the Pliosaur was even more massive, about 54 feet nose to tail, and weighing in at perhaps 10 tons. Behemoth and Leviathan. Were they fantasy creatures? Or is it more than coincidence that we find fossils that could match their qualities. And then, how would the author of Job know about such animals? Well, secular scientists tell us that these creatures disappeared millions of years ago, long before any ape-like creatures took on human form. But how do they know that? Perhaps we should look at the data. Here are two dramatically different timelines. On the left is an evolutionary one. From the formation of the Earth, perhaps some four and a half billion years ago, we see the beginnings of single cell life. And as it evolves over millions of years, we come to the age of the dinosaurs. That would be some 235 million years ago. And they reigned for about 170 million years. Then, some catastrophe. Many believe it was an asteroid impact that changed Earth's climate, spelled the end of the great beasts. Compare that picture with what may be called a young Earth biblical scale, there on the right. It presupposes a creation some 6,000 years ago, and the flood of Noah in about 2500 BC. The Bible says that flood lasted about a year and wiped out all the air-breathing animals except for those on the ark with Noah's family. Now both charts show a period from which fossils come. The evolutionary chart has some 170 million years of dying and fossilizing and then no more since they'd all died out. The Young Earth Biblical chart has the majority of the fossils from the time of the Flood, only a year or so, when vast numbers of animals died catastrophically. So then, each chart has a period in the remote past from which our fossils come. The question is, was it millions of years long and millions of years ago? Or was it only a year or so, and only thousands of years ago? Our best clue for this will be the fossils themselves. It's worth asking just what produces fossils. Let's take a familiar example, such as this buffalo, or American bison, if you prefer. We all know that up through the 1800s, there were countless buffalo on the Great Plains, 
They were so plentiful that people even killed them just for sport. When the Transcontinental Railroad came into use, some passengers would lean out the windows of their car and shoot the animals indiscriminately. There were so many that you could hardly miss. And then, one day, we found that they were almost gone. With so many millions of the beasts killed in those years, there should be countless fossils, shouldn't there? But I've never seen one, and it's not likely that you have either. The death of an animal doesn't automatically result in its becoming fossilized. Rather, it takes special conditions to make a fossil. First, there must be an absence of scavengers who would tear the carcass and consume it or scatter it. And the carcass also has to be protected from oxygen, which is a prime agent in causing decay. These two conditions are rarely met, and so most plants and animals that die leave no fossils behind. The most likely condition to produce them is a catastrophic burial. Then they can be preserved from the work of predators and decay-causing oxygen. And as you might guess, billions of fossils would be produced in a global flood like that of Noah. Well, let's return to our big question. When was the age of the dinosaurs, and when did it end? The data are clear and accessible to everyone. There are no recent fossils. We don't see them being made today. We see the source on each of these charts. And there are huge numbers of fossils. They were created in some remote period, as both charts show. But was it millions of years ago, or only thousands? Just recently, a major clue to the answer appeared, and it came from the labs. Quote, There's also physical evidence that dinosaur bones are not millions of years old. Scientists from Montana State University found T. rex bones that were not totally fossilized. Sections of the bones were like fresh bone and contained what seems to be blood cells and hemoglobin. If these bones were really tens of millions of years old, then the blood cells and hemoglobin would have totally disintegrated. Also, there should not be fresh bones if they were really millions of years old. End quote. It was Dr. Mary Schweitzer who made this discovery. Realizing how significant it was, she went to her department head and reported what the microscope had shown. Her supervisor told her to go back to the lab and dig deeper and determine for sure whether she was right. She and a colleague spent another two years studying the evidence from every perspective, and when they published the results, a firestorm of controversy arose. Have you heard of Wired magazine? It focuses on science and technology and how they affect our culture. The editors commissioned a major article on this discovery. Here is the conclusion it reached. Quote, Asara and Schweitzer, in other words, have done just what the critics asked. They've built a rigorous scientific case for the survival of 68 million year old proteins from a beast that animates children's imaginations." End quote. Notice that the author still believes in the evolutionary time scale of millions of years, but even so he acknowledges that Dr. Schweitzer was right. Now every biologist in the world will agree that hemoglobin, red blood cells, and flexible connective tissue cannot survive for, at the very most, more than a million years. But there they are. Perhaps the millions of years scenario is wrong, and the Genesis account is correct. It has creatures, like the dinosaurs, created on day six. 
quote. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Well now, these are clues that suggest that dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. But whether millions or thousands, it does seem that they're gone now. I've not seen one, and I would guess that you haven't either. So, they are extinct, right? It certainly looks that way. Still, to say something is extinct is to make a judgment. It's a judgment based on two observations. First, that we don't see any examples of that particular animal or plant. And second, that there are fossils to prove that it once lived, but none of those fossils are recent. Those two facts give us a presumption that something is extinct. But if you think about it, not a certainty. Have we really looked everywhere on earth, under every bush and rock? Perhaps, then, we can't really know. There have been some misjudgments about extinction. Take the Wallamy pine tree. We had numerous fossils of them, but all were believed to be at least two million years old, and no one had ever seen a living example. Then, however, one turned up in the Australian outback in 1994. Where had it been hiding all those centuries? As you see, the conservators put a fence around it and took cuttings, and now the wallamy pine can be found growing in many places. So, not extinct, after all. And then there was the coelacanth, a large, rather ugly fish. The only fossils we had of it were supposedly from the late Cretaceous period, more than 65 million years ago. And then, in 1938, a live coelacanth was caught in the Indian Ocean. And since then, others have been found. So, a bit of caution is called for here. We can say that something appears to be extinct, but absolute certainty eludes us. Extinct or not, though, it is pretty clear that dinosaurs are not to be found, either in zoos or in the wild. They certainly appear to have died out. And no doubt you've seen discussions about what happened to them. Despite the talk of a dramatic end, such as a strike by a huge asteroid, there could be more mundane explanations. Here's a comparable case, the woolly mammoth. What happened to them? Well, there may have been circumstances that contributed to their demise, such as climate change, but we know of at least one obvious factor. Woolly mammoth remains have been found with arrow or spearheads embedded in them. It's possible and maybe even likely, that we are the cause. We hunted them to extinction. Or take this fellow, the saber-toothed tiger. He too may have been a casualty of man's increasing dominance over the wilderness. This observation is appropriate here. We need to remember that many plants and air-breathing, land-dwelling animals have become extinct since the flood either due to man's action, or competition with other species, or because of the harsher post-flood environment. Many groups are still becoming extinct. Dinosaurs seem to be numbered among the extinct groups." End quote. We hear often these days about how the damage we are doing to the ecosystem, as we encroach more and more on it, is leading to the extinction of many species, plant and animal. 
so there may be no mystery at all to the disappearance of the dinosaurs. If we lived alongside them, as we did with the mammoth and the saber-tooth, then the lure of dinosaur stakes may have spelled their end. Still, we'd be wise not to close the book entirely on these terrible lizards. Perhaps they are gone, or perhaps they are just deep in what remains of Earth's wilderness. There have been dozens of strange reports over the years by explorers and others. Note this from Roy Mackall in his book A Living Dinosaur in Search of Mokele Bambembe. Quote, we gathered more than 30 detailed descriptions of the Mokele Mbembe, and these fit the configuration of a small sauropod so well that I find it impossible not to accept the identification, at least tentatively. Each of the reports was a first-hand eyewitness account by informants from widely differing ethnic, cultural, religious, and geographical backgrounds. The animal is said to range in length from 5 to 10 meters, or 15 to 30 feet, much of which it owes to the long head, neck, and tail. And here is a report of an expedition to Cameroon in 2000. The members interviewed natives who had not previously talked with a white man. Shown pictures of various animals, they identified sauropod dinosaurs as readily as crocodiles or elephants, but not other dinosaur pictures. One might assume that, in a desire to accommodate the visitors, the natives might say that they had seen every kind of animal they were shown, from crocodiles to sauropods to theropods like T. rex. But why claim familiarity with sauropods and not with other dinosaur types? That suggests they had seen the one, but not the others. One wonders. But apart from these second or third hand accounts, let's stay with this question a bit longer. Did living humans ever see living dinosaurs? You will recall that passages in scripture seem to suggest that, both with land and aquatic beasts. And in addition, there is the possibility that, as a people, we have memories of dinosaurs, but distorted by the passage of generations. Have you considered the similarity between theropods like T. rex and our dragon legends? Both are lizard-like. Both have large heads and teeth, small forelegs, large hind legs, and a massive tail. Give T. rex wings, and he'll easily pass for a dragon. Come to think of it, where did our dragon stories come from? We find them in many different cultures, whether China, Sumeria, India, Scandinavia, or even England. Remember St. George and the Dragon? How did these different ethnic groups all manage to invent the same kind of beast? There's a professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida who has a theory about that. He's David E. Jones, and here is a video clip from him. Finding the whole picture involves solving the biggest dragon riddle of all. How does the dragon keep turning up in so many cultures? Dr. Jones believes that the dragon is actually hardwired into our brains remnants of instincts that kept our evolutionary ancestors from being eaten. And the fact that they were dealing at that time and for millions of years after that time with three basic predators and these were big cats that would hunt them and these were uh, big birds with 10-foot wingspans would hunt them uh, or big snakes would hunt them. Over the millennia the image of the three basic predators of our ancient ancestors merged into one terrible creature, the dragon. Now let's compare Dave's idea with the biblical one. 
He says that over the millions of years of our evolution, our ape-like ancestors had three kinds of predators to fear. Generation after generation, we saw our fellows fall prey to eagles or hawks or snakes or the big cats. And over those centuries, the images became wired into our brains. And eventually, they merged into one fearful beast, a snaky flying monster with teeth and claws. Sounds likely? Or is there a glitch here? Why would the three images merge when the predators were still around? We were continuing to hide from vultures, snakes, and leopards, and we would certainly know them apart. But anyway, Dave believes this is where our dragon myth originated. The Bible suggests a different scenario, one in which our remote ancestors saw and feared real dinosaurs. And as those beasts gradually died out over thousands of years, the memory of them faded and became distorted. And from that, the myth of the dragon was born. I frankly find it difficult to buy into Dr. Jones' theory, since there seems no reason for these three predators to morph into one while they are still there to see. Rather, I'm inclined to say, come on, Dave, surely you can do better than that. In any event, there is one other dimension to this question. Is it possible that some of our ancestors saw dinosaurs and produced likenesses of them, not transmogrified into dragons, but as they really were in nature. Let me suggest that that may indeed have happened. Here, for example, is a petroglyph from Kachina Natural Bridge in Utah. One can't actually date a petroglyph, which is made by scratching or chipping at the rock face, but natural weathering establishes that it's at least a few hundred years old certainly predating the arrival of Europeans in the American Southwest. These petroglyphs are universally agreed to have been made, then, by Native Americans. And what do we see here? An animal with the distinctive long neck and head, huge tail, arched back, and short legs of a sauropod dinosaur. Now, images like this one were carved long before archaeologists dug up dinosaur fossils and learned what these creatures looked like. And if this is not a dinosaur, then what is it? Or perhaps another example, this one from the rainforest of Peru. Vance Nelson was led to this cave by a local archaeologist. Since this is a cave painting made with pigments, it is possible to date it, and plasma oxidation testing showed that the painting was done about 1300 BC. Let's take a closer look. The animal we see here is surrounded by hunters bearing shields and spears. And what are they hunting? It has that same distinctive shape of a sauropod dinosaur, and this from 3,000 years ago. Were they really hunting a creature that had died out 65 million years before their time? Well, let's see one more example. Not a petroglyph done by Native Americans, nor a cave painting 3,000 years old, but, well, this is from Carlisle Cathedral in England. It adorns the tomb of Bishop Richard Bell, who died in 1496. His grave, like many others, is set into the floor of the cathedral. Around its surface there are brass carvings of various animals, such as this one, a bird done realistically enough that one could guess its type. 
and among those artistically done animals there is this one. Foot traffic over five centuries has worn it, but it's still clear enough to make out. Two beasts with their necks intertwined, and notice the anatomical details. Long flexible necks, legs that are turned downward not like other lizard types, such as crocodiles, whose legs point outward. Very long prehensile tails, arched backs, the knees bending forward like ours, and the elbows backward. All of this anatomical detail, specific to sauropod dinosaurs, and done over 500 years ago to remain on display ever since. Oh, and there's one more thing. Do you see that the tail of the animal on the left has spikes on the end? There is a species of sauropod dinosaur that has that feature. But we have only known that since a fossil example was found in 1989. How would a late medieval artist have been able to get all of this just right? Unless, of course, he had seen such beasts. Suppose we put this together. None of us today has seen a living dinosaur. Whether creationist or evolutionist, we have to judge by the evidence that's available to us. And since we have different presuppositions, different world views, our judgment will be colored one way or the other. A secularist comes to the question with assumptions like life arising from non-life, death, struggle, pain, disease, extinction, all over millions of years, and he will fit the dinosaurs into that framework. An observer who subscribes to the biblical history will be thinking in terms of creation by God, corruption when sin entered the world, catastrophe of a worldwide flood, confusion of tongues at Babel, Christ, the cross, and the consummation with new heavens and a new earth. He will fit the dinosaurs just as comfortably into that framework. And when he does, it'll look something like this. The dinosaurs were formed on the sixth day of creation along with other large animals. Our parents' sin caused the fall and the fall of the physical creation, and some dinosaurs became predators. The flood destroyed all of them but the few that Noah sheltered in the ark. In the post-flood years, the surviving dinosaurs from the ark gradually died off, and their memory faded with the passing generations perhaps morphing into our dragon legends. And finally, of course, they were found, beginning in the 1800s, to appear in our museums. Secularists have their interpretation of the evidence of dinosaurs, a scenario that requires millions of years. But a biblical perspective from those same data gives us a very different picture, requiring only thousands. The evidence is there. You must decide which view is the more persuasive. If you have questions about this lecture, or any of the others in the Good Answers series, you may address them to me, Dr. Jerry C. Four, at yahoo.com.